You've downloaded Saturday Live. This programme was first broadcast in 2016. We have Royal Jelly, we have the a r Cat, we have some fairies, we have Mother Teresa and the Missionaries of Charity. Good morning and welcome to Saturday Live, where we celebrate the Queen's 90th birthday by finding out how to make Buckingham Palace out of jelly. We entertain two, a Prince of Stage and Screen, Freddie of House Fox, Scion of the Acting Dynasty. We nod in the direction of Euro 2016 with an up-and-coming English ref. We remember Mother Teresa with the almost unbelievable story of an abandoned boy in Kolkata. And we have inheritance tracks from the man who's tousled more golden tresses than Rumpelstiltskin. Nikki Clark. All these plus JP Devlin and the pop picking kitty to come. So, welcome to our guest then to the actor Freddie Fox, to football referee Mary Harmer, to listener Gautam Lewis. Now, Gautam Lewis was born in Kolkata in the 70s. When he was three, having contracted polio, he was abandoned by his family and left to fend for himself on the banks of the Hooghly River, where he was found by the missionaries of charity, the order founded by Mother Teresa. He lived in their orphanage in that city until his circumstances changed dramatically and some extraordinary twists and turns were to follow. But Gotam, you've just been back to Kolkata. Was it the first time since you were there as a child? No, it's um, it's the first time since I was a child that I liked it. Ah. <laughs> um, so that was fulfilling. It's probably my fourth visit um, and it was as any visits to India they are quite intense and do you find you're kind of remaking your relationship with the city because your life started out there in unimaginably tough circumstances the conclusion for this trip is I'm no longer afraid of Calcutta right. and I have had good or bad a love-hate relationship the hate because the memories were not fond um, and I didn't like the memories of knowing that your life started on the sort of the mean streets of Calcutta although it's called the city of joy I didn't see that part yeah um, it's very hard when you don't have a childhood as other children have because you are just surviving um, but the love is seeing the city of joy with all its wonder and charm and the music, the poetry and the kind of the open, open-minded open attitude in terms of its multi-faith city. Your access to a life of richness and complexity and joy came about, well, in extraordinary ways. First of all was when you met someone who was working in Kolkata who took an interest in you in the orphanage. Patricia, who um, was working there, and when she was about 15, it was a priest who'd just come back from Calcutta that planted a seed in her that maybe one day she could go there. So she'd always had uh, a longing to be there. And then when she started volunteering, what they would do is go around all the orphanages looking for children that they could then take to their rehabilitation centre. So eventually, that's where I got moved, and um, that's where I had all my corrective surgery. And I th- I've always been quite crafty, and um, so there was something about her that I knew I needed to hang out more with. So to get her attention, I would take the little cats that would run around the bed and gently strangle them until Patricia would come and say, you mustn't do that. Great way of attracting oh, attention. Yeah. Yes. Don't try that at home, folks. No. <laughs> <laughs> to cut a long story short, we have to run through it, I'm afraid, but yeah. Patricia ended up taking you to New Zealand and you spent the next chunk of your childhood in a completely different place. Mm. Well, I went from, you know, a tiny location in Calcutta to Mission Bay, which is very bohemian, and it's the house was next to the beach, so suddenly where it went from very black and white, it went to sort of very colourful tropical paradise. And um, that's where I learnt to speak English. And that's where I forced myself to forget about those first seven years because, as I'm sure we all know, children can be quite cruel. So, And I didn't want to, I didn't want to be different. So I wanted to fit in. Which you were because you were a different colour from other children and you had a physical, a visible physical disability. So that must have been a challenge. Yeah, and that's why I thought if I can assimilate these new surroundings by not allowing those differences to get into the way of the... The only thing that I did keep was my love of Indian food. Right. <laughs> you never walked past a curry. 
No. <laughs> but you did use your resourcefulness and your, your craftiness, as you've, de- as you've described it. That must have come in very useful in the next extraordinary chapter, where you ended up going to the same posh London prep school as Prince Charles. <laughs> Wearing knickerbockers. In Wearing knickerbockers, <laughs> yeah. Hill House, famous school. Yes. So, hang on, we're in New Zealand, you're beginning to find your feet in this new identity, and then all of a sudden there you are in knickerbockers and a jumper at Hill House Posh Prep School. How did that work? Um, Patricia finished her uh, three-year contract at the University of Auckland. She was teaching nuclear physics, and she'd always planned to come back to London. And it was the right time in the sense of it was time for me to meet my rest of the family. Because you've been adopted by now, by Patricia. Yes, the adoption went through the New Zealand courts. Yeah. So I have a New Zealand birth certificate. Okay. Um, and, the, and my birthday was assigned to me based on the uh, court hearing. Um, but in New Zealand, that's the summer. In England, it's dreary February, winter. Um, so schooling started in London. We lived in another bohemian area called Notting Hill, Portobello. Um, but my grandparents lived round the corner on Pont Street. And because Patricia travelled quite a lot, it was easy for me to go to Hill House. And actually what was really nice about Hill House was there were lots of children from all backgrounds. Yeah. So in a strange way, I fitted in perfectly like I had in the orphanage. Because nobody fitted in. No one fitted in and we were all had a wacky background. And also that gave you wonderful access to education and that's something that, again, with your resourcefulness and your craftiness, you've turned very much to your advantage. Education is so important and actually the contrast could not be more different, being one of India's poorest to the other. And not only education but also the healthcare and just being able to be brought up to be independent. Incredibly tough, though, because both those things could dramatically erode your sense of yourself, particularly switching between one extreme identity to another very different identity. How do you preserve your sense of who you are in all that? It's very hard, and it was probably the first time I went back to Calcutta was when I was 18, and that triggered an almighty crisis of self-identity. Yeah. So to answer that question, it took me about 10 years to work it all out. How? By going through a lot of roller coaster of emotional up and down. Um, but eventually, you start to forget about all the wrong reasons as to why life should be awful and all those things. And actually, you start to realise it makes this individual a lot more interesting to have the two worlds so I started to embrace it. But what you need is perspective and it strikes me that one of the themes of your life is getting perspective. You look at the world through the lens of a camera, you're a very accomplished photographer, you fly above it too, you take to the air in flying machines. Again, that's a different perspective and I wonder if that's something that you've learned to do as a way of making sense of this extraordinary story. Well I've also lived around the world and I've travelled quite extensively So I've got to see how different cultures and different people interact with one another. So the rich tapestry of the interaction that I've had with people has given me that perspective. So it's always based on who I've interacted with and how I've been brought up. You've interacted with some spectacularly interesting people (laughs) close to home too because there's another extraordinary chapter, well, there's so many extraordinary chapters in your life, but your career then in the music industry in London in the 1990s in which you ended up managing Pete Doherty and the Libertines. You're going to have to tell us about that. <laughs> I have never set out to do anything. And one thing led to another, and I was lucky enough to work with quite a well-known music mogul called Alan McGee. And um, I guess I could demonstrate to Alan that I could handle um, the hedonism of rock and roll. <laughs> And so when the Libertines came along our roster, I was assigned to work on the band with Alan. And it was a a hurricane, an earthquake, all the natural disasters you could think about as the band travelled. And our job was to fix it all afterwards. Um, (laughs) But there was not a single dull moment um, and I would never change it for the world. But but it, 
I just think hedonism can turn into something a bit darker and a lot more self-destructive very quickly. And this was where, if you talk about perspective, when I got to know Pete quite closely because I was on a one-to-one with him, and what I mean by one-to-one, you know, Christmas Day, all those moments in, 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 a, in a year, um, and when you start to see what drug abuse can do to an individual and they've pressed the self-destruct button and the knock-on effect it has onto the family... It is very heartbreaking. And if you're sitting in a room with someone on Christmas Day and they are in tears, it's really harrowing. And you you literally... Part of the job was to keep him alive. Um, And it was through that time that I started to reflect back into the circle of Mother Teresa, thinking, hang on a minute, you know, is my life about this... Or was there a different destiny? Mm. And and I didn't like to use my energies in that sense anymore. And that was the start of the, the acknowledging the, the self-identity. And the return to Kolkata. And then the return to Kolkata, especially with the polio eradication work. Mother Teresa, due to be canonised, officially declared a saint by Pope Francis in September, a controversial figure for some, but uh, how would you rate the importance of the work of the missionaries of charity in your life and in the life of street children in Kolkata? Well, yeah, she is controversial, and um, so are lots of uh, Nobel laureates, whether it's Gandhi or Nelson Mandela, whoever. And indeed saints, not always cute. Saints, um, But from my perspective, certainly I wouldn't be sitting here had it not been for the love and the care that the missionaries have given me and other and other children. Um, I think it's always the, it's never the wrong time to make a right decision about someone becoming a saint or canonized. It is a long process; so it just doesn't happen overnight. Um, and especially seeing in the last few weeks what she's meant to Calcutta and the people I hadn't found a single person that didn't have anything bad to say about her in Calcutta and you've been taking photographs of people in Calcutta especially people who've come through the care of the missionaries of charity are we going to get a chance to see those pictures I can send them to you for your website. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we will certainly do that. We will certainly put them up and link them to our website. But the exhibition is taking place in Kolkata. The exhibition is called Memories of Mother Teresa, and it's my way to pay homage to her extraordinary work. And what I've done is I have retraced those seven years that I had in Calcutta. So I went back to the home of the dying and the destitute, where she started her work, then to the orphanage that I lived in, and then to all the other... Um, like you said about volunteering all the other places where people volunteered to look after me and essentially it is a collection of 30, 35 photos that sum up the ghost of the person that I could have been but also the happiness and the smiles of what Calcutta is in 2016 Great, well we very much look forward to seeing those pictures Gautam Lewis, thanks very much for being with us Gautam of course is with us till the end of the programme do get in touch with your comments. You can text on 84844. You can email saturdaylive at bbc.co.uk or tweet using the hashtag BBC Saturday Live. Well, we have had a correspondent. We've had an email from Richard Townend, the headmaster of Hill House. What a joy to hear Gotham speaking on your programme today. I remember him at Hill House when he used to swing down the banisters of the main staircase <laughs> at such a speed that he still holds the world record for the descent from the top of the building <laughs> to the front hall. I also remember singing in the choir where he always had to be in the front row and he became our mascot, even if not our best singer. Not as good as Pete Doherty. <laughs> <laughs> but pretty good sliding down banisters, obviously. A major skill. Just, <laughs> just let gravity, yes, fall in gracefully. But someone else would have carried my bag. <laughs> <laughs> um, we should talk a little bit about um, some of the stuff you alluded to about what you do now in terms of, of, of what you kind of left the music business to do to help other people. Tell us about the flying. Well, it was leaving Calcutta in an aeroplane that made me fall in love with this machine. And after the world of rock and roll, I got my pilot's licence and made that dream real. And that feeling of being liberated from disability Mm. um, set up a foundation, or not not for profit, called Freedom in the Air. 
So some of the audience and the listeners will know of a person called Douglas Bader, who was a famous RAF fighter pilot and essentially started the uh, ball for people with disabilities to get involved in aviation. Um, and so now aviation is a really good way to rebuild people who might not have a reason to get out of bed in the morning for mm. all sorts of reasons. Mm. Um, um, so the flying is very close to my heart and um, also take lots of pictures and make lots of films mm. and documentaries. Mm. And how do people get in touch with the, if they want to take part with the flying? They can search for Freedom in the Air. OK, we have a link on our website as well. Um, thank you very much for that, Gautam. OK, this is a, for Gautam. Uh, fantastic to hear your guest from Calcutta. I lived in India for two years working with women and children. We eventually adopted a two-year-old little girl who is now a wonderful 17-year-old and the joy of our hearts. She started her life in an orphanage. Those who are critical of Mother Teresa cannot have lived in India and seen the suffering of the most vulnerable, especially children. Your guest is being too hard, describing himself as sneaky. Lots of adopted children display this characteristic. You saw a chance to increase your chances of survival and utilised it. So thank you for that. Our guests were Freddie Fox, Mary Harmer, Gautam Lewis, Tim Simpson, Nikki Clark. Thank you to all of them and to you for listening. We are back next week with the singer Rick Astley. Until then, from all of us, goodbye. Goodbye.